So hello everyone. The title of this talk is Running Private Institutions. My name is Julie Bukabza. I'm an independent curator and director of 89 Plus Europe, which is a research program founded by Hans Ulrich Obrist and Simon Caste. So tonight we have first Miguel Rios, who's the director, curator, co-founder of the Portuguese Fondación Leal Rios in Lisbon with his brother Manuel. Miguel is also a designer and his foundation showcases contemporary art and design since 2012. Then we have Ina Bazenova, sorry, I'm a little sick, a founder in Artibus Foundation, foundation that equates Russian audience to foreign art and Russian art to European viewers. Also, but she also bought the art newspaper in 2012 and she's based in Moscow. Then we have Daniela Zeman, currently chief curator of TBA21, Tisan Bonimitsa Foundation in Vienna. There is currently on view an, an, an NSO NATO show. Sorry. So um, we are going to start with uh, Daniela. My first question is for everyone, and then we'll have a short introduction of all of your institutions. Private institutions are becoming increasingly important for both showcasing and collecting art, as well as for art education. What makes founders establish their institutions? What are the challenges running them? So we will start with Daniela. Thank you, Julie. Um, would you be so kind and put up the presentation for us? Thank you so much. Um, I don't know how I'm going to do this. I'm trying a little performance because it's hard to see and talk at the same time. So maybe just this image for me epitomizes the way we are thinking about objects, collections, the collector. These boxes, the so-called archival boxes, traditionally contain the information on works of art that we collectors, so to say, and institutional people working for collectors are storing in, in our sort of archives. These archival boxes are, of course, the generic image of something that has passed. Today's collector is no longer the person you know, who is a connoisseur and basically for his own pleasure puts together the riches of the world. I think today's collector is, um, I would say many of them here today are professionals who dedicate their lives, their visions, also their monetary assets into collecting and bringing the idea of collection slash institution on a different level. And I think that's an important aspect to keep in mind. The collector slash institution, um, as I said, has all the aspects and all the elements of an institution in, in the case of sort of dedicating the collection's work to um, the public, has all the aspects of an institution that we know as a public institution. So that's why I like to sort of start with this sort of old box idea, which um, is the idea of the past. And I'll continue working a little bit, talking a little bit about TBA 21 more specifically. And that's why I'm standing here, because it's a bit hard to do these things at the same time. But let's see. OK. <laughs> I was promised that this would work. Ah. OK. Um, TBA 21 was founded in 2002 by Francesca Habsburg here in Vienna, in Austria. Um, we have a public space currently, or a space for public viewing currently, oops, at the Augarten Park in Vienna, not far from here. We're running two to three exhibitions from the collection, mainly from the collection in that particular space, but we have been having collaborations, exhibitions, public programs all over the world in different institutional settings, biennials, art fairs, and so on. So basically the work is emanating from Vienna, but really radiating way beyond Vienna. And one way to do that, and one way to sort of focus on our programming is exactly what you see here in the back, and that's the commissions. And now I'll just sort of run through quite a few of these commissions without saying too much about them. Some, uh-oh, wait a sec. I knew this would happen, it always does. So my, <laughs> Okay, why don't you just do it on auto thing? Just quickly run it. There are quite a few images and I'll keep on talking, sorry. So if I don't need to do this, then I'll come back on my seat. <laughs> Makes me le less exposed to you. Um, 
Yes. So basically, the, the commissions the foundation has started, um, and this is the first larger commission that you see, was, for instance, a voyage against the current artist Kutluk Ataman. Uh, we designed an exhibition on a vessel that actually traveled from the Black Sea all the way to Vienna. And in every stop, there was an exhibition involved with an artist who has uh, a relationship to... <laughs> now we're somewhere else. Okay. Um, I don't know how I can do this. Yeah. Anyway, there are quite a few commissions that you see here in the back. Maybe just as an idea, most of these commissions, as you can see, are fairly large scale, are quite ambitious in their, I would say, both functioning in the work, how you, for instance, this is the elevator bed from Karsten Huller, where visitors can stay overnight, where they can book um, the, a visit in the museum and stay for a whole night stay in the institution. We have developed the work with Karsten, we have commissioned it, we have produced it, we have shown it um, in the exhibition space, and we have basically you know, run it throughout the six month uh, period in the exhibition in Vienna, but originally for the Hamburger Bahnhof, where it was first shown, and one of the images, I think, were from the Hamburger Bahnhof. Maybe we can move a bit further. So you see a few of the commissions. One of them before, was Christoph Schlingensee. We spent three months with Christoph in Iceland, where he has produced one of his largest sort of art-related um, installation. Um, this is a work by Superflex, again, inaugurating the exhibition space that we currently have at the Augarten. This space was built in 1956 by an Austrian artist called Gustino Zambrosi. And the historic research that we have put in place by moving into the space has shown us um, quite some involvements of this particular artist with the Nazi regime. Some of the material you've seen in the background um, are demonstrations of that. We have found this material in archives in, 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 in Germany, unpublished material at that point. And in order sort of to re-examine the historic narrative of the space and of this particular artist, Mr. Ambrosi, we have actually focused on one particular sculpture, which is the sculpture of this cow that you could see, I think, at some point. This cow was part of a commission that he had from Albert Speer in 1943. He was supposed to make a group of sculptures for the Neue Reichskanzlei in Berlin and then went to Kitzbühel to find the most beautiful cow he could you know, use as a model for his sculptural work. And um, the photograph that you've also seen, Ambrosi hugging this particular cow, is one of the few um, surviving materials from that time, from 1943. The rest of his archive was destroyed from that time. <coughs> and um, Superflex basically used this figure of the cow to sort of reconnect to the historic past through inviting and through finding some offsprings of the cow that Gustinus had identified in 1943 and bringing it to the Augarten. So this idea of exorcism, this idea of sort of investigating um, the past through the work of artists is obviously kind of a research methodology that some of the commissions have. Um, let's just move on. This is the cows as they are. Another work by Simon Starling, again, sort of an examination of historical narratives. This is Jean Prouvé roof that he has road tested. Let's move on. So all these are, as you can see, fairly ambitious, just on and on, fairly ambitious pieces that involve performative research part. This is a work by Carrie Evans where we have worked with CERN um, in Switzerland and basically looked at the Higgs bosom research um, in order to sort of find a modulation for the piece. <clears throat> the second area, so commission is really the first area, I would say that is very much at the core of the foundation, producing, commissioning large scale works. Second area, exhibitions. Let's continue with exhibitions. Here, as I said, 
both exhibitions at our space in Augarten, but also in neighboring or partnering institutions worldwide. There is a, a Janet Cardiff large-scale work which we have commissioned, produced, and shown in various sites. Let's move on with that. So this is, I think, the installation in Hamburger Bahnhof. Continue with it. That's the same piece. Or Sharon Locker, the Noe Schol, an exhibition we had in our space. And as I said, all these exhibitions always involve works that are either commissioned, produced by us, or are works that we have in the holdings of the collection. Um, just move on quickly, yeah. So we're just running through a few examples of exhibitions, so you have a general idea of the feeling of the space, of some of the installations within the space. Just go ahead. Amar Kanbar, again, you know, I'm just very quick and, 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 and sort of cursory here. Um, again, this is a work where we have spent four years developing the whole concept, uh, supporting Amar in this particular project, which is called the Sovereign Forest and really sort of focuses on issues of the sovereignty of both indigenous people in Orissa, India, and the sovereignty of nature in today, today's sort of Anthropocene. Let's move on. So long-term collaborations is an important um, element, geographic width, working outside of Austria, working with artists that are generated on, please, that are um, from, other, from other territories, from other geographies, from other contexts, working with performance, so performativity is an incredibly important aspect, as you can see in this project with Ragnar Kjartansson, uh, which involved an exhibition, a performance, and um, sort of the production of a filmic work, yeah, over the course of one month in the exhibition space. Public space, you know, I think this is an important moment here in this talk. We are very focused on this issue of, on the question of public space. So how do we actually create uh, artistic formats that work in the public space? This is a piece, let's move on, called The Morning Line. Just move on, please. Um, another work which some of you have seen probably at Documenta, which is Sanya Ivekovic's Poppy Field. These are two different types of poppies that were um, planted together. One are the opium poppies and the other sort of the symbolic poppies that you, know, you have outside in, in, in the forest. Just move on. Yeah. Olafur Eliasson and David Ag. This is a permanent installation on the island of Lopwood. It's a collaboration between Ag and, uh, and Eliasson. It's been there since 2005. Um, just gone. So this is Olafur's Your Black Horizon. As you see, people come in, go out, use it op openly and publicly. Important to say that all of our exhibitions, not just exhibitions in public space, but all the projects that we support are always free. They are free of admission. They are meant to actually be very inclusive and open to general public. Okay. Run through this, please. Matthew Ritchie and Naranda Lash. Morning line. We have seen this structure, I think, in the first photograph. Gone. There are a few photographs of this piece. So it is actually a sculptural, architectural piece, but also has a sound component, a huge sound archive that goes with it. Um, gone. Karsten Huller. Permanent installation next to our space in Augarten. Please go on. Again, Karsten Höller. This is a, a stage structure. So this building in the back is the exhibition space. The stage that you see on the side is our summer stage, where we have a full summer long um, spoken word performances you know, every Friday night, about 10 or 12 throughout the summer. Just go ahead. OK. So some examples of sort of public programming, educational programming, 
This was in the context of the Noesh Kohl exhibition, Sharon Nock at Noesh Kohl exhibition. This is the Noesh Kohl Dance Company, who has not been outside of Israel for 25 years. This was the first time they left Israel. They restaged some of these very old choreographies by Noesh Kohl from the 1970s here at the performance at the secession in the course of the exhibition. So, so these are workshops with students where the methodology of Eshkol was presented and rehearsed. Go further. These are these ephemeroptere. As I said, it's a format of, of spoken performances. Here you see a few examples with some artists, Gilbert Betterbauer, Johannes Bosch. Go ahead. Wanda Coleman. Um, so you see basically the sort of general idea. This was Blixa Bargeld, La Stampa, and so on and so forth. So you see the sort of general atmosphere. Again, this idea of having a space in a park, I think is an incredibly sort of, maybe the most public moment one can even have. And I think that's where the format of this ephemeroptere talks is specifically designed to the space. Go ahead. Just quickly, yes. So you see some of these things, of course. And this is um, the exhibition that we currently have. Um, I'm not showing you the exhibition, but just the public symposium part of it. It's an exhibition by Ernesto Neto and the Huni Queen called Arukushipa. The Huni Queen are Amer Amerindian people from Brazil. Ernesto has developed the last series of work to this particular collaboration. And the Huni Queen had two residencies so far, and they will have a third residency in, in the context of the exhibition. And here you can see some healing ritual, singing rituals, and, um, you know, can, go ahead, workshops that we had in the context of their residencies here in Vienna. So I think this gives you a little bit of picture of the breadth uh, or, and the aspects that I find particularly important in our work. And with that, I pass on the microphone. Я здесь, наверное, выступаю в двух ипостасях, как издатель и владелец международной газеты об искусстве и как основатель фонда, культурного фонда Инартибус. Миссис Инна Беженова is here both as the founder of the Artibus Foundation and also the owner and publisher of the art newspaper. Uh, издателем Art Newspaper я представляюсь не так давно, всего с прошлого года. И выбор этого издания был для, и этого вида деятельности был для меня вполне осознанным. And uh, I can tell you that I became the publisher of the Art Newspaper only last year. And it was well thought through for me. Я один из многих коллекционеров в России, но один из, наверное, из немногих, кто в равной степени уделяет внимание и российскому, и западноевропейскому искусству. I am one of the many collectors in Russia, but I am one of the very few who pay equal attention to West European and Russian art. Mm. Uh, я собираю классическое искусство, и в искусстве меня в первую очередь интересуют точки схода, а не точки отталкивания. Взаимовлияние, умение умение учиться друг у друга и обмен информацией. Mutual influence, the ability to learn from each other and the exchange of information. И выбор здания характеризует мое отношение к искусству как глобальному, сложному, общемировому процессу. And uh, when I was thinking about, about becoming the publisher of that newspaper, it reflected my opinion, my vision of the art as a global process. И в нашей деятельности газета – хороший инструмент для того, чтобы вовлечь в этот процесс как можно больше людей. And I can tell you, in our field, a newspaper is a very good tool to attract maximum numbers of people. Здесь, конечно, самое важное – сохранить независимость от влияний юридических, экономических, политических 
и так далее. И у газеты соответствующая репутация, и я надеюсь, что мы будем и дальше поддерживать эту репутацию. В прошлом году мы открыли также в Москве пространство нашего фонда. Фонд называется In Artibus. Он находится в центре Москвы, в таком музейном квартале. И мы там проводим и собираемся проводить несколько выставок в году. And uh, last year we opened uh, a new building, a new uh, art space, cultural space of our In Artibus Foundation. It's situated in the museum quarter in the center of Moscow and we are already organizing a number of exhibitions there and are going to continue this work. В своей деятельности, в деятельности фонда, конечно, в первую очередь отражает мой личный интерес коллекционера. And of course, the activities of our foundation are a reflection of my personal interest as a collector. Я думаю, что роль частных институций в этом смысле очень важна, потому что государственные институции, как это ни странно, насчитывают, их история насчитывает всего лишь сто с небольшим лет. And I believe that the role of private institutions cannot be underestimated, because public institutions have kicked in in our field only about hundred years ago. То, что коллекционеры, допустим, те же Габсбурги, были в свое время руководителями государств, главами государств не имело самое важное значение. Важно то, что они делали в своей коллекции, важен их вкус, их выбор, их личная страсть. And the fact that the Habsburgs were also emperors doesn't influence the fact that when they were acting as collectors, it reflected their taste their attitude, their choice, and their ideas. И им было интересно этим заниматься. И нам тоже интересно заниматься, собственно, наши собственными, собственными предпочтениями. And uh, they simply like doing it. And we like what we are doing based on our preferences, of course. Одна из наших целей — это обмен информацией, это продвижение и популяризация классического искусства российского за рубежом и, наоборот, западноевропейского в России. And one of our goals is increasing the awareness, the promotion of Russian art, of classical art abroad and of the Western art in Russia. Например, мы два года назад провели выставку Михаила Рогинского в рамках Венецианской биеннале. Это был большой, большой проект в институте Кафоскаре, и он имел очень большой резонанс, и многие впервые познакомились с этим художником. And I can tell you that, for example, two years ago we organized an exhibition of the famous artist Rogensky in the framework of the Venetian Biennale. And I can tell you that some people learned who it was and the importance of this artist for the first time. Следующая выставка у нас была в Москве. Это выставка московского художника Владимира Вейсберга. Он наш современник, но он продолжает традиции классического искусства. Another exhibition that was of great importance to us was the exhibition of uh, the artworks of Vladimir Weisberg. He is our contemporary, but he is the follower of the classical style in art. Мы планируем также показывать этого художника в Германии, в Дрезденской национальной галерее и так далее. And we are planning to show his works in Germany and in other countries. Также мы считаем важным для себя бытование вещей из нашей коллекции. То есть мы постоянно находимся в контактах с мировыми музеями, даем свои вещи на выставки, также музеи предоставляют на наши выставки свои вещи. 
carry out exchanges with other museums. We regularly lend our artwork to other museums and we also borrow from other museums, institutions, from other collections for our, for our exhibitions. Например, совсем недавно работа Зурбарана была на выставке в Тиссенбарнемисе в Мадриде из нашей коллекции. Just recently, one of the Zubaran artworks, paintings, was at the exhibition in Madrid. Работа Сюра совсем недавно вернулась из Голландии с большой выставки в Кроллер Мюзе. Recently, a Sura masterpiece came back from Holland from a huge exhibition in Amsterdam. Следующая выставка у нас планируется совсем скоро. Большая совместная работа с музеем, с государственной институцией, с музеем искусствознания России. And uh, the following exhibition is going to be organized jointly with the um, Institute of the Study of Art of Russia. Public institution. It's a public, which is And, a public uh, institution, sorry. Uh, я считаю, что здесь хороший пример сотрудничества между частными и государственными институциями. And I believe that this is a great example of cooperation between the public and private institutions. С нашей стороны была инициатива провести выставку, с их стороны была инициатива в рамках выставки провести конференцию, посвященную этой выставке, а выставка двух художников 17 века, Сальвато Розы и Гаспар Дюге которым исполняется в этом году обоим 400 лет. This was an exhibition of the artwork of two artists, Salvatore Rosa and uh, Duguay, uh, the two artists of the 17th century. We contributed the initiative, the idea, and they contributed as a public institution the conference that is going to be devoted to this exhibition. Я считаю, это хороший пример сотрудничества частной и государственной институции. И многие музеи дадут нам вещи на эту выставку, такие как Эрмитаж, государственный изобразительный музей имени Пушкина, некоторые итальянские фонды и так далее. This is already a great example of cooperation, collaboration between a public and a private institution. And actually many museums, many famous, outstanding museums express their willingness to lend some artwork for this exhibition, such as the Hermitage, the Pushkin Museum, and several Italian foundations. Также, конечно, мы ведем издательскую деятельность. Вот недавний пример перевод дневников швейцарского архитектора на, с итальянского на русский язык, который позволил даже сделать некоторые научные открытия. And uh, we are very keen on our publishing activities. Recently, we have translated from Italian into Russian a journal by a Swiss architect, which led to a discovery. Russian Architectural Museum, even благодаря этой публикации, произвел несколько атрибуций архитектурных объектов в России. And uh, the Russian Architecture Institute succeeded to attribute some of the buildings in Russia to this architect. Ну вот в общих чертах то, чем мы занимаемся, и я я готова дальше включиться в обсуждение каких-то аспектов сотрудничества с государственными институциями. So this is what we are busy with and I would be only ha too happy to continue our interactive discussion about cooperation working together with public institutions. Мне кажется, что здесь не может быть конкуренции, что конкуренция между частными и государственными институциями немножечко надуманная, потому что если фонд плохой, то его просто не замечают, если он хороший, то он только обогащает культурную жизнь и привлекает как можно больше людей в общий художественный процесс. I believe that there can be no competition between them, because if a private foundation is bad, nobody, it will go unnoticed. But if it's good, it will enrich the culture, enrich the people and make its contribution. Thank you. It's terrible because with all this presentation and um, we're waiting for Miguel, we, uh, they already answered all my questions. <laughs> Hello. Hello, so I have to stand up is better for me, I think. Uh, so 
I would like to, to show you some images here. Can you put the first one, please? Is this logo of the foundation? So, uh, meanwhile, uh, I'm not a formal guy at all. And uh, so I have to read just a little, uh, a, a very small paragraph because it's the formal thing just to tell you what is the foundation about. So, the Alrich Foundation is a Portuguese institution governed by private law whose main goals are the dissemination, upkeep, preservation and promotion of works and art is represented in the contemporary art and design collection, which me and my brother uh, have assembled over the last 14 years. Located in Lisbon, Portugal, in a space specifically adapted for this purpose, the public will be able to view the collection through temporary collection, uh, exhibitions, sorry, events and publications. The Leal Rich Foundation program also includes additional learning activities to support a better understanding and appreciation of both national and international art and design. So, this is uh, the foundation. It's a very small foundation because as a foundation we are very young, with three years old only, but we collect for 14 years. And we have an exhibition room, we have a video uh, hall room, and all the storage and warehouses are around us. It's a kind of 1,500 square meters foundation. And these are names of Portuguese artists that maybe you don't know because Lisbon or may Portugal, the artists from Portugal, they are not so well known abroad. Only maybe uh, Julian Sarment that belongs to all of the collections around the world and museums. And uh, maybe Elena Almeida that is going to be recovered now because she's an artist from the 60s. And uh, during that period, she was really very contemporary, but she was not well known. Even because in Portugal, there were not art galleries during that period, only one or two without international connections. And so I showed you some names, but this is how to show what kind of pieces and what kind of contexts I choose for my collection. And so this is Lina Lopes, for example, is a very, very uh, cutting edge uh, artist, but already with 14 years old. And uh, this is a piece that it seems is something that is totally broken, but it's not. It's a piece that is uh, totally cut by laser and is totally symmetrical. Normally, what we do, and I'm showing only some, some um, uh, just one piece by each uh, artist, but normally what I do as a collector is to collect a group of pieces of an artist when I like the artist. I cannot do res residential uh, uh, artist schemes in, in our foundation because we are totally private. We don't have funds from the public uh, government. So what we do is to help the artist is to buy a uh, uh, group of pieces of him and continue to follow him uh, 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 during the... the um, during is a uh, work. Anyway, André Roumain is the most emerging artist in Portugal now. He's totally abroad. I mean, he's, he's a wide world known, a very, very young artist with only 22 years old that is now starting to be uh, at uh, the most important exhibitions around the world. Angela Ferreira, she went to Venice and um, from that period that, three years ago, she's a very politician uh, artist because she was born in Mozambique. And um, she links the, 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 the politician uh, way of life and the wars after the, 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 um, after the colonization by Portugal. So she links these two parts and she's a really very good sculptor. We have plenty of that, of that, of that uh, of, uh, work. Joan Louro, she was this year, she's a, a, at the Venice Biennial, uh, Biennial actually, and she works as a painting, is blind images. The paintings, blind images are very well known, but I wanted to show something totally different when he works as a sculpture. Julian Sarmento, this was an author that we made to the artist. This is something that I do as well. When we have several works and we present the works in an exhibition uh, 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 in our uh, uh, exhibition room, we ask the artist to close the group of pieces that we have or to open another door. So we order him a piece, a totally different piece. 
And this was of a phase of, uh, of uh, maybe a third or fourth phase of his uh, work because she represents always the women, the women, the women, sorry, without hat. And this is something very particular on this piece because she put a bag, a black hat on her head, and these are totally different pieces from his face. And so this big, uh, big one was showed when you opened the, 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 the exhibition, uh, the, the foundation three years ago, and is already, I, I don't know, I lent it to some more five or six international uh, um, exhibitions uh, in Europe. Luis Paul Costa, it will be our next exhibition on the 26th of November. Is a painter, this is a painting. Is a sculpture, a painting installation. That's what we collect the most, installations. And on this case, this guy painted thousands of meters of that movie film, movie, um, yeah, that's it. And so we are going to, to show, and for this exhibition, actually, I'm going to invite, for the first time, a curator to work with us. Because normally, the curator is me, because I'm the curator of the collection. And so normally I'm the one that chooses the pieces, so I'm the one that works with the artists to, to arrange the, the exhibition space. But for the first time, because this artist is not well known anywhere, only in Brussels, only in Belgium, because the collectors that like, the, like him very much are the, 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 the Belgium collectors, so I invite him, I'm going to invite, or I'm invited already, sorry, uh, a Belgium curator to curate his work on this exhibition. Rodrigo Oliveira, this is an artist that doesn't exist anymore. He finished his work, and so we have several pieces like this huge installation, is a garage, and, uh, um, and, uh, and so uh, nothing, just to show his amazing work from his first years of work. Rui Schaffs, a well-known connection from, from uh, he only has he has only connections between Portugal and Germany. The collections are from Germany and Portugal. He works on this kind of material and huge sculptures for the public space and for the interiors. This is a very big one. It seems not, and it's, not, it's on the floor, but uh, the, 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 the installation should, put, should be put on the ceiling. Rui Sanche, the last exhibition that we showed. It's a very respectable uh, uh, sculpture in Portugal but is not well known, of course, but we made this very nice exhibition. And this, sorry. Oh. These are some of the artists that we have in our collection, international artists. And when we started to, 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 to buy the, the, the when we started to, to collect, we started with the Portuguese ones only. But there is an amazing Portuguese collection in, uh, in Portugal, only with Portuguese artists. So after five years, we decided to go abroad and, and to open to the international field. But as you know, the international field is the world, and the world is huge, and the artists, and the amazing artists there are. So I shoot some of them that we have here, and the ones that we have more pieces. And Timmermans, is the drawing guy um, from Belgium. I'm just showing this, just to show you the, the, the context of the collection. Anthony McCall, we have some of his light, light uh, 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 like uh, cones, and, uh, and this is what the first one, before, before uh, he went to university to teach for 25 years, he's the first one to make the circle. Anthony Mantadas, video. Benoit Marie Morisseau. As you see, I like everything linked with architecture, space, black and white, rough materials. People are never present there. Just small piece of people, just a shadow sometimes. What I really like is to establish the, 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 um, the meeting between, the, 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 the relationship between we when we see something and the space and the sculpture, the, 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 the installation and the architecture. Denis Farkas, one of the last pieces that we acquired uh, maybe two years ago or one year ago, I don't remember. This is just a detail of the piece. The piece is an amazing piece um, that is a frame of books and is constituted by 75 books. And, uh, uh, and it's about 
philosophy and architecture as well. So the media for me is not important. The important is the communication from the pieces. John Wood and Paul Harrison, they, if you know them, the, it's uh, always about video. Uh, they work on video, they, are, they have lots of humor. This was a very serious one. It's about space and about the difference of that point that you have there that is always the same shape, the same, the same diameter, but at the end, this is a huge, a, a, a huge box. Matt Mullican, the relationship between the codes, the architecture and the symbolism of people. Mauro Resti from Brazil, photographer. Scott Short, for example, nobody knows about this Scott Short, about this uh, American, uh, 40 something or 50 artists. But that is not important for me as a collector. What is important is the art pieces. What is important is what it does. And if it is, one, is it well known or not, I don't care. Because the value of the collection is not about the artists themselves, the value of each artist, but the value of the construction of a context of a collection about a discourse. It's what I want to do. Just to show you uh, one of the exhibitions, it was for the, uh, the opening of the foundation. As you can see, this is uh, Francisco Tropa, a Portuguese that she was, pre she was presented at the Venice Biennial uh, five years ago or four years ago. Uh, I don't remember. And this is the first time we presented an individual show. And here, when, we, when I buy these pieces, when I work with the artists to make this show of these artists, I also buy all the information about him, all the books about him, all the newspapers about him. Why? Because I want to make a discourse. And this is just one of the pieces. Becky Beasley, the biggest international exhibition she had at Lisbon, in Lisbon, at our little foundation. But it was her first, first exhibition, a huge exhibition there. The famous Correct 2 that makes her the, one of the most in, in, excited and the most interesting artists in the uh, United Kingdom during, I think, 2015, 2013, I think. This was, for example, when, uh, one of our commissions. To close the group of pieces, I asked her to, 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 to do a piece, and she made this huge, uh, uh, huge carpet, let, let's say, and uh, she closed the group, but she opened the door to another exhibition. Why? Because she asked me, because it's a unique piece, she asked me to open an exhibition in, Bris in Bristol with this piece as well. Helena Almeida, the very old Portuguese old lady with uh, 80 years old, but now she's being rediscovered around the world. After, uh, we, this, is our, this is our nuclei of pieces that we have, she's going to have a big retrospective in uh, Serral uh, in Porto, and after that she will have 10 exhibitions around the world, from Tokyo to the Tate Modern to New York, I don't know. But she will going to cover the world, and this is a recovered artist. A video of a uh, work, and you see the atmosphere of the room of our foundation. The, the offices are upstairs in the library. We have a library with about uh, 15,000 books, and we are open to the, um, to the public, mainly to the ones that are doing doc, uh, PhDs, doc, uh, masters, and so on. The first group exhibition, and this is how we make our publicity in uh, Art Review magazine, Moose magazine, international magazines, because in a way we are a little bit away from Europe and from the art scene, but we are not. So the way to communicate is very important to us. So we make this publicity around the world to these magazines and to show how I can, can contextualize these huge names like uh, the Titanic, no, can say, Lawrence Wiener, Alan Sekula, Matt Mullick, and Jonathan Monk, Anthony McCall, with Adelina Lopes. Do you know Adelina Lopes? Nobody knows. It's an amazing Portuguese artist. The Tani Klein, maybe you know, he's from Brazil, but they are amazing artists. Max Fry from here, do you know that? Do you know him? I don't know if you know him, but he's not well known in Portugal, but he's contextualized with huge names, with big names, 
and this was the first approach to the conceptual work of our, of our foundation. And this was the, 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 the exhibition. And finish with this Max Fry rotator thing. Internationalization of the Rio Foundation. We cannot be in Lisbon only. You have to internationalize our exhibition. So, this was, I was invited, or the foundation was invited to show our pieces linked with the moving image, videos and moving image. And this was the, 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 the publicity that we made uh, in some magazines and uh, through the websites, whatever. And it was, this is Sophie Wetnall video, an amazing view that she was drawing the, the, the sun around, uh, the, the, the sun, the, the all day sunlight on this place, and it makes this movement. So it was not about the video itself, it was about the moving of the image. Francis Tropper again, we cannot see very well, but this is a, a reflection of, 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 of water falling down in that, that small uh, um, ball, transparent ball, in a laboratory, um, laboratory uh, environment, and so make that movement of the, of the waves. So we are speaking about 17th century, when they were making the, 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 um, proje the first projections. And finish. And so I'm here. Just, uh, I'm here just now, I'm here because I was invited, of course, but always, uh, and also to, to tell you that, uh, uh, in a way, in Portugal, there are very good artists, international artists are there showing. There are lots of small, but good, in a way, I can say, of course, um, collections, very discreet, because it's one of the things that Portuguese have. We are very discreet, even I'm not. But uh, Portuguese, in a way, they are discreet, showing the things. And, um, and so this is one of the things that I do to make also the collectors, Portuguese collectors, to make what I do. Because we have the, um, the institutional collections from the government, of, of course, and the collections and all, everything. But uh, we need more, uh, we need more uh, private collections to be shown. And thank you. Thank you, Miguel. Thank you, Daniela, Miguel, and Ina for your presentation. I think we already have a really good overview of what an insti a private institution is nowadays. So I'm going to just ask them one last question and one first question, which is amazing. It combines both. So private institutions are mostly the vision of one man or one woman. So how could you ensure the continued existence of institutions beyond, beyond sorry, the founder's life? So. Who wants to start answering that question? Daniela. Well, in my case, compared to um, my colleagues here, I'm not a founder, so I can, I can only speak as a curator. But obviously, a private institution runs through certain cycles in uh, its institutional life. In the case of Francesca Habsburg, um, as you have mentioned aptly, She's the daughter of a collector. She's the granddaughter of a collector. Her father's collection is in the Museo Tissen Bonemica in Madrid. Um, so I think the example of being part of a generation of collectors, and as I said initially, of understanding, and I think your, both your presentations were very uh, critical to that note that I made initially, that Francesca's life and professional life and outlook is being a collector. It is not a private joy, it is an occupation, it is an expertise, it is um, a profession, really. And in that sense, it is not something that comes and goes. And I think when um, you have stressed the, 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 how can I say, the personal choices, and I think both of you have, the personal choices and joys of working with one artist rather than with the other, um, this is the same thing that happens in, in public museums as well. You know, a curator or a museum director will always decide on personal tastes and personal interests. Um, and not on some sort of collective idea of sort of the general good. So my, my point here is 
the professionalization of the collector's work, the institu institu institutionalization of collectors also means that all collectors, I would say, who take it as seriously as our institutions that we represent here, are thinking about the question of continuity. And this is obviously something that we all have to think very creatively about because there are many challenges. And it is, um, you know, there was a time where the state was very interested in attracting private collectors, such as the Museum Thyssen Bonemica, for instance. Maybe we have graduated from that time, you know. Today, in the economic situation, given the situation in which the state is, yes, a certain museum would like to be recipients of certain works of art, of selected works of art. But even the burden of receiving all our collection, for instance, yeah, this collection, the TBA 21 collection, would cover just, you know, by putting works one next to the other, something like 45,000 square meters, you know. So I don't know if you have similar numbers, but seeing what you collect, you know, there's a massive scale. And as you've also seen, the works that our institutions are looking at and collecting are not just ambitious because of their history and provenance, but they're ambitious also as physical works of art. The maintenance, the knowledge that goes into them. Um, there's a completely different skill set at collecting the things that we have in our collections. Um, there may be some, I would say, more sculpture, more um, you know, this is not a competition. I'm just sort of mentioning some of the issues related to the issue of donating works. So I guess my point, just to, to finish my little cursory move across that question, is that um, there are examples. We know some of them, private collectors opening their museums, private public partnerships, um, the dissolution of collections. Also, this is happening. But I think what is important today is really develop models and develop refreshing and interesting models. And I think they can be something like cross-national partnerships between collectors yeah? or you know, the gathering of private collections, public collections to really make um, on some national turf, you know, as you said, your expertise in Portuguese art is so great that probably no public institution can match your holdings. Yeah? In, in some ways, uh, it's quite similar in our case, although we're not concentrating Austrian art, but the kind of art we are collecting is something that most of the, 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 private, uh, the public collections in this geographic area will not be able to match. So I think these, these, these models, these partnerships, this idea to sort of move into the 21st century um, with the respective skill sets and at a, at a high level with public institutions is extremely important because this is what the future is going to be, whether we want it or not. But I think this um, is actually the next step in which, um, you know, not just private and public institutions, but the entire field is moving. Start. Miguel, maybe, and then we will... Well, uh, our problem as a family foundation, uh, it's uh, to whom we leave the, the, the foundation on one day and to whom we leave our collection. The collection is not know, only about pieces, as just, as just said, because it's about space. We have to collect and to have space to put the pieces, to, 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 to storage them and to preserve them. These of our goals is to preserve certain pieces of art that we bought already and that they have to be preserved. And this um, is nice when it's on the beginning, like I'm doing and my brother and uh, my assistants. But uh, one day, I don't know what is going to happen. It's really a worry that I have. Of course, we have a very good example in Portugal with the Golobankan Foundation. We spoke a little bit uh, before and uh, he arrives to Portugal and he donates the, all the collection with a huge uh, contract. Of course, maybe it's a possibility because if I want to share my work, if I want to share this Portuguese and foreign artists in a context and then in a discourse, maybe what we shall do is to donate 
uh, the collection, but I'm speaking as an artistic director. Of course, if you are going to speak with the president of the foundation that paid for everything, maybe he's not going to think about that because uh, he's spending the money of his life in a collection. So maybe he wants to preserve the collection with the family, but the family sometimes is not the best uh, want to preserve our, our dreams. So uh, it's something that I really don't know. Maybe partnerships with museums, maybe partnerships with the other institutions in Portugal or around the world. Uh, we don't know. So because we are really very young, I think I have more 20 years to decide about that. And uh, so we'll see. No. 50 years. No, yeah. I don't arrive to the 100 years old, I'm sure. More than 50. <laughs> Ina? I believe uh, that I agree. It's a very complicated question. And there is no one single answer. Because it all depends on that private person who initiated the founding of that foundation on his personal goals, on his personal visions. Конечно, этот основатель должен позаботиться о том, что будет дальше с его институцией, and, uh, и подумать об этом заранее. And of course, the founder should think about what is going to happen with that institution, with that foundation, and he should take, he or she should take care of that in advance. Мне кажется, если в основе этого лежит качественная коллекция, то его дальнейшее бытование, в общем-то, проще определить. And I, but I believe that if the basis of all of that foundation is a high quality collection, its further existence will be assured. И мы много знаем подобных примеров, когда несколько поколений владеют определенной коллекцией, потом это превращается в частный музей и существует или превращается в государственный музей, или превращается в частный музей, который существует много десятилетий после ухода and, and we know of numerous examples of uh, situations when a collection is owned uh, by several generations of the same family and then it becomes a museum, either a private museum or a public museum, and uh, it ensures its eternal existence. Это тоже и здесь представлены Тисон Бранемисы и мой любимый Райнхард коллекшн, например, в Швейцарии, Райнхард коллекшн в Швейцарии, Бюрле, музей Бюрле и так далее. Есть много примеров, но об этом стоит, конечно, позаботиться заранее. And uh, uh, we, we know of such examples as uh, Bonimis Thyssen, my favorite collection, Reinhardt in Switzerland. But all of that should be taken care of in advance. Сложнее, если основу фонда из основу частной институции составляет какая-то деятельность. It's much more complicated when the basis of the activities of a foundation is actually some type of a type of activities actions например вот издание газеты об искусстве нельзя назвать бизнесом то есть с моей позиции это тоже такая активность частная активность because for example publishing the art newspaper cannot be called doing business from my point of view it's also some sort of private collectors activities И в данном случае я являюсь продолжателем того, что был начато 25 лет назад, основателем этого, этого издания. And this way, and in this way, I believe that I can be called a, a heir, somebody who continues the activities that were started 25 years ago. И вот он позаботился, передал свое дело в какие другие руки. То есть на мне лежит определенная ответственность продолжить и потом тоже передать кому-то дальше. So somebody took care of that and passed this relay into my hands, and now it's my responsibility to think who will take the relay from me many years from now. 
Ну и в конце концов, что касается, ну даже, даже каких-то частных коллекций, я не вижу большой трагедии, если после длительной и активной и э, плодотворной деятельности институции закрывается. Все равно, если это было э, умно, если это было глубоко, то это будет плодотворно, даже если он будет действовать какое-то ограниченное количество времени. И он может, так и подобная частная институция, даже после закрытия может оставить свой след в истории. And, uh, frankly speaking, I do not see a tragedy uh, if uh, after many years of uh, long, fruitful collecting work in this field, uh, um, an institution, a foundation ceases to exist. Because if it were deep, profound, intelligent, it will leave, in any case, it will leave its trace in history. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you so much. I think we're at the end. Uh, I don't know if we have time for questions from the audience, maybe one or two questions. I was a bit late, but maybe I missed that, I and mean, you mentioned that. But um, for me, it's also very interesting. How do you, uh, when, when, when the institution is private, how do you define a, a line which is, is it connected to the personality per se, whatever the person who the founder of the foundation is collecting, or is it detached from it at all? How, from, from the beginning, let's say, I, I, I'm thinking about it. How do you define it for yourself? Maybe I missed that point, and, and then I will watch the video. Um, well, I, I, can, I can only speak about TBA 21. I, I, I started working at the foundation exactly one year after the foundation's inception. So maybe this is a particular situation. I've been there ever since. Um, when I joined the foundation, Francesca Habsburg was um, you know, maybe what we, what we would call a, collem, a collector and nothing else. Um, you know, kind of having been initiated by her family of collectors, this was something that she wanted to take on after her father had died. I came from the, from the museum's world. I came from organizing many large-scale exhibitions, working with artists, developing this idea of you know, directly commissioning and engaging artists of today. So I guess this is where our sensibilities have come together and we've worked very closely together in uh, developing that kind of programming that in a certain sense maybe takes you from just your personal view on things into sharing your idea with curators that you, um, that you engage and maybe with a larger board of people who also help you and engage you. But honestly, I have to say specifically when it comes to, to acquisitions, I really think that it is extremely important that the collector loves the pieces he or she acquires. Because if that disassociation happens, you know, if you no longer engage with, emotionally engage with the art you buy, I think on the long run, you know, you disconnect and you, you, you know, the, the, this sort of, how can I say, the maturation maybe comes way sooner. So I think um, what we do at the foundation, our foundation is fairly large. We are about 22 people who work there. We have, you know, collection department, curatorial department, marketing department. I mean, we are kind of already set up in a way um, where a lot of expertise is coming together. So we are definitely preparing and moderating um, various decisions, but the decision-making process at the end is something we take very closely, you know, together with Francesca Habsburg and me. Thank you, yeah, that, that was exactly <laughs> what I was interested in. But as I said, it wasn't so different in the, in the public institution I worked with before. <laughs> was the same. I mean, I can only say that the parallel is, is, is greater than, at least as from my curatorial perspective, than one would imagine. So uh, since it's very late, I, 
I think we have to end this endless conversation now, unfortunately. And thank you very much, Daniela, Miguel, and Ina for coming. And I hope it's going to bring more and more questions in the future. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.